Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word, and we're looking at the book of Acts. We call our series Studies in the Book of Acts, and we're in Acts 11 today. We start this chapter, and the opening verses are recapping what has happened before with Peter's visit to Cornelius, but for an important reason, as we'll see. Acts chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Now by the reaction of the believers in Judea, it's apparent that this was a surprising turn of events. They weren't expecting this. Salvation uh, was of the Jews. And they, as the Lord himself talked about in John chapter 4, they had the temple after all. They had the oracles of God. They had the covenants of promise. Uh, there was nothing really that said that this coming of Messiah was for the Gentiles. It was for Israel. Now, it's true that the prophets foresaw the day when it would go out to the nations as well, when through Israel, that seed of Abraham, who is the Messiah, and we know him to be the Lord Jesus Christ, will bless all nations. And also we know that all nations will flow to Jerusalem. All nations are going to come up in the future to submit to the Lord and to learn of him in the day of his kingdom on earth, when he comes to rule and reign on the throne of David for the thousand-year millennial kingdom. And so, yes, there's hints and there's inferences, we might say, in the Old Testament that the Gentiles were going to be included in this great saving work of Messiah. But to think that they'd be made part of the same spiritual body as the Jews, to think that they'd be co-equal with their Jewish brothers and sisters on the grounds of grace through faith in Christ, I mean, that was just beyond their comprehension because the Gentilic world was so pagan so given over to idolatry. And where there's idolatry, there's also rampant immorality. And so there were all kinds of awful fornications and adulteries and perversions of one sort and another, and violence and lying and corrupt practices. And so the, the Jewish people, you know, looked at that and said, wow, how messed up these Gentile world, uh, this Gentile world is. And these Gentile nations are so far from God. And they weren't uh, wrong. Ephesians 2 affirms that. We were far from God, but now we've been made nigh through the precious blood of Christ, is what that chapter teaches us. The blood of Jesus Christ brings us near. Why? Because our blessed Lord shed that blood on the cross as a sacrifice to deal with the sin question and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, to enable God to judge the sin but to pardon the sinner, to free us and forgive us. And not only to free us judicially and say, we won't suffer the penalty of sin, but also to sanctify us, to make us his holy people, 
to deliver us from sin's power so that now we're not enslaved to it anymore. We have a different power within, the power of God's own Holy Spirit changing our hearts and minds and giving us the power to overcome. And of course, one day this is going to correspond to our being delivered from the very presence of sin. We shall be glorified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's part of the golden chain that Romans 8 talks about, that justification and sanctification are going to ultimately culminate in glorification with the Lord Jesus. And that involves being conformed to his own image and likeness in heaven, in the Father's house. Now, wonderful salvation that we've been presented, and the Jews thought it was wonderful. These Jewish background believers who had put their faith in Jesus, who had said, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, they knew that God had raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ, as Peter had said in Acts 2, and they had believed. So they knew about the truth of the gospel. They knew about the wonderful power of God to change their lives. The only thing was they didn't think that it could uh, change the Gentiles. They didn't think that the Gentiles would be interested or that maybe they didn't think that God was interested in the Gentiles. And as we've noted before, there was a great deal of uh, anti-Semitism. There was a great deal of hatred on the part of the Gentiles toward the Jews. And it was reciprocated that the Jews had no love for the Gentiles either, typically referring to them as dogs. But here, these different walls that had been built up in the Old Testament, many by God's command, because Israel, in their spiritual childhood, learning the elemental principles of the faith, so to speak, and both Colossians 2 and Galatians 4 use that kind of terminology to describe the law, that it was God's teaching tool. It was an educational thing. It was, in other words, uh, pedantic in that it was meant to teach and train us in our spiritual childhood, to train Israel, to teach them about God's ways and who God was, and to protect them from intermingling with those pagan nations and falling into their idolatry and immorality. But now that Christ had come, the Holy Spirit was coming to dwell within each believer, and there was a new power to overcome sin and a new way to avoid uh, falling into those things. And rather than maintain those walls, the walls were broken down in the sense that the church is told, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The Lord had said that in Matthew 28. Now the fulfillment of that is coming to be seen in Acts 11, just as the Lord had promised in Matthew 16 to give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter. Peter used those keys to open the door of faith for the Jews in Acts 2, and as we noted to the Samaritans in Acts 8, and now to the Gentiles in Acts 10. And there was incredulity in Judea about this, in the region surrounding Jerusalem. So Peter had to go up and talk about that. But look at how verse 1 describes it. That now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Isn't that an interesting way of looking at it? They had received the word of God. It wasn't Peter's word. It wasn't his opinion. It wasn't some new doctrine. They had received the word of God. This was something God spoke through the apostle Peter. This was confirmation of the gospel that had been spoken by the Lord while on earth and by John the Baptist and by the prophets of old. And now they were seeing that word of God come to them. And as Romans 10 reminds us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's the incorruptible seed that 1 Peter 1 speaks about by which we're born again. We're born again through God's word and it creates a great change. Now, Peter went up to Jerusalem. That's the normal verbiage in the New Testament because Jerusalem is over tw uh, over 2,000 feet above sea level. So you're going up somewhat literally, but there's also a spiritual connotation that you're going up to what's poetically called Mount Zion. You're going up to the city where God has placed his name and to the place where he had his house built. So there's supposed to be an ascension there to his place. And that's why many scholars think that the Psalms of Degrees or Psalms of Ascents, as they're also called, were uh, sung by pilgrims or by people on their way up to Jerusalem, particularly at times of the feasts of the Lord. That may be so. But in any case, uh, Peter was going up to give his account of these things. He came up to Jerusalem, verse 2 says, and those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. 
Now, there seemed to be a continuum of thinking in Jerusalem. There were those who were really adamant on maintaining the Jewishness of their Christianity. They wanted to hold on to the traditions of their fathers and to their culture as believing Jews. And from this point on, really, in the book of Acts, we see a tension that the apostles are walking the line, trying to unify the church between believers who are of Jewish background and believers who are of Gentile background. And sometimes it's easier to walk that line and sometimes it's more difficult. But we have to remember this was progressive revelation. This was brand new truth to them. So it's not surprising that some would sort of have that knee-jerk reaction and say, wait a minute, they can't be saved. They can't come into the grace of God. You went in and ate with them. Now, Peter himself knew the controversy of that position. Even when he went to Cornelius's house, he had told them there, you know it's not lawful for a man who is a Jew to come into those who are Gentiles. But God had taught Peter that what God has cleansed, he should not call common or vulgar. So God, in doing this sacred work of salvation among Gentiles, it shouldn't be Peter's personal scruples that stand in the way of the grace of God coming to them. And so Peter knew what their objection was going to be. And even when there was proof, when Cornelius and his household believed, Peter said back in chapter 10, verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So even among those six men, those other believing Jews who had gone with him, to witness what was happening, he was assuming there might be an objection here. They might have a problem with giving Christian baptism to these Gentiles. But he points out, hey, they're obviously saved. How do we know they're saved? Because God gave them the Holy Spirit as well, the same gift he gave us. This is the confirmation of their salvation. Now, Peter here recites the vision that he had in Joppa when he was praying and how the Lord let down the sheet from heaven and did this three times and told him to rise, kill, and eat. And Peter talks about his own objection. Imagine the embarrassment of having to say in verse 8, But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. It's something when you're more holy than the Lord, though, you know. Uh, I say that tongue-in-cheek. And we're never more holy than the Lord. We're never right and God's wrong. I mean, that, that never happens that way. And sometimes in retrospect, we say, oh, you know, what I thought really was standing for the truth was my own opinion. It wasn't really bound by the Scripture. It wasn't standing on what God's Word actually says and teaches. So to say not so, Lord, we've noted in a previous study that's an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. It doesn't make sense. A non sequitur. It doesn't logically follow. If he's Lord, we say, yes, Lord, we obey. Uh, the Lord told uh, Samuel, uh, told Saul, rather, through Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, to obey is better than sacrifice. So your scruples about the clean food laws, Peter, well, already the Lord in Mark 7 had made all foods clean. He had rescinded those ceremonial food laws. And you didn't get that, Peter, but now God's giving you this vision to show you more specifically that those food laws, Leviticus 11 and like passages, aren't in force anymore. That part of the ceremonial law was didactic. It was meant as a teaching tool. It was also meant as practical protection against becoming unequally yoked with the pagan nations round about with the idolatrous nations. So uh, there was a specific historical purpose for those laws. And now God's purpose has changed in that the gospel is going out to the nations. It's not going to be localized in the territory of Israel. And the Gentiles have to come to Israel like the Ethiopian eunuch came to Israel or Cornelius had come to Israel and they had received the faith of Israel. Now the faith of Israel, the faith of the one true God was going out to the nations. So these walls were broken down. Now, and the, Peter also relates that you know, God's providential timing in all of this. Not only was God showing him this in the vision and preparing him, but he said just then the three men who were sent came and stood there. And notice verse 12, he says, Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. So again, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. 
And this shows us again the personality of the Holy Spirit. He's not merely a force. And it shows us the deity of the Holy Spirit. This is the Lord speaking by his Spirit. The Spirit of God is a member of the Trinity. He is part of the triune Godhead. And again, to say part of doesn't express it, but he is God and he is co-equal with Father and Son. And so uh, Paul recognized, sorry, not Paul, Peter recognized his personality and the authority of his command. So Peter went and those six brethren went as eyewitnesses as well. So imagine seven Jews who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ going into the Gentiles and seven being the biblical number of perfection or completion. Uh, this is going to be a complete bearing witness to the Gentiles receiving the gospel. Now, he tells them, verse uh, 15, that as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, John, of course, said that back in Matthew 3, but look how Peter describes it. He says it's the word of the Lord. So the apostles recognized what John the Baptist said as scripture, as the word of the Lord. It wasn't John speaking. Yes, he was the, the man who was audibly talking, but he was speaking the word of God. He was speaking prophetically, speaking forth what God wanted to say. And he's recognizing this is a, a proof, therefore, of the inspiration of the Gospels, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the word of God, and it's authoritative like the rest of the scriptures. So he remembers what had been said there, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now that was said to Israel, uh, but Peter said, well, if God gave the Gentiles the same gift he gave us, then obviously he's saving us in the same manner. Therefore, God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could withstand God? Well, indeed, who are we to get in the way of God's plan and purposes? We should never stand in the way of what God wants to do. We should obey and carry out God's will and preach his word to every creature. And so there's no racial scruples, no ethnic scruples, no national scruples, where we say, I don't want to preach to this person because they're different color from me, or because they're from Russia and I'm from Ukraine, or they're from Ukraine and I'm from Russia, or they're from this part of the world and I'm from another part of the world. No, they're rich and I'm poor, or I'm poor and they're rich, or I'm rich and they're poor, whatever. We can make all these distinctions, but we have to go out and preach that same gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. So the people, once they heard this testimony, the apostles and the brethren at Jerusalem uh, were manifestly moved by this. Verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, uh, saying, then God has also granted the Gentiles repentance to life. Go figure. I'm so thankful for that verse because I'm a Gentile. If that verse wasn't in the Bible, if this teaching wasn't in the Bible, there'd be no place for me. But there's a place for me. There's a place for you, whoever you are listening. You can come to the Lord Jesus and be saved. The old hymn says, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. And such is our great saving God. Well, no problem with being wrong. We all are uh, sometime or another and very often frequently. But the wonderful thing to do is when God's word shows you you're wrong, we repent. We change our minds. We take a different position and we say, I was wrong. God's right. I'm going to do it God's way. Pardon me, Paul Anka and Frank Sinatra, but not do it my way. We're going to do it God's way. That's the believer's way. That's the Christian way. That's what the word of God ordains. Thank you for listening and tune in next time to hear about the second half of Acts chapter 11. Thank you very much.